where is it that when when you ran into Quentin over breakfast, what restaurant well, was about that? About 200 yards or so from where I live, a restaurant that I went to, a table full of actors went there from Schwab's Drugstore when, yeah, it, closed when it closed in 1983 closed. to a place called the Silver Spoon. It was originally okay. called Theodore's, but... I was there for 27 years. I was at in at Schwab's for uh, you yeah. know however many years from 65 to 83 intermittently. Yeah. Because I didn't live here all the time. But from the time I uh, started going to the Silver Spoon, I was there 27 years, and I was in the same spot for all Amazing. that time. I had my own table. Your own. You were such a wreck. You know, it's funny. So when you were going to Schwab's back yes. in the late 70s, yes. I was across the street going to Hollywood High School. So Holy <laughs> so moly. <laughs> if I'd known, I would have come over. Because <laughs> that was after Banyan, I think. Because Banyan was Banyan 70... was 72. Two, okay. 71, 70 was, 71 was the pilot. 72 was the series. Maybe it was uh, 70 Because that's where I first you first came to my attention was Banyan. That's what I remember. Oh, I love that show. Yeah. Yeah, that was... Who was the showrunner for that? Uh, Ed Adamson. He wrote, created the show. He was the producer of the show, and he died while we were shooting our wow. uh, order of 15 shows. And so the show was expensive. He passed, and, uh, and eventually uh, it just got canceled. Wow. Do you have enough of a level on us, Ethan? Or Okay, so we're... Oh, we're rolling. I didn't. Remember. Okay, so I'm going to do the setup that night. I'll do your bio and all that stuff. By all means. We'll just go into this. Um, so, Bob, thanks. We've just finished watching Jackie Brown, and I wonder, do you ever go back and watch the film? I haven't seen the film in many years, but tomorrow I'm going to Santa Rosa for the 20th anniversary showing up there um, of Jackie Brown. Uh, so I will see it again uh, tomorrow night. That's that's great. And uh, I'm curious. We've just seen, we've just seen the ending of the film. This powerful, cutting back and forth between you and Pam. And what what was in your mind as you were doing that scene? Interesting. Almost every uh, word of that movie was well scripted. Uh, Quentin writes wonderful dialogue. I knew that from. Earlier, I'd read earlier scripts of his, uh, True Romance and uh, and others, and uh, Reservoir Dogs, for which I uh, auditioned. I thought I was going to get the part until he told me that part wasn't going to be mine. It was going to be to go to um, uh, the old gangster um, who was played by. Uh, okay, okay. That's all right. That's all right. All right. Almost the whole m movie was well scripted. The last scene, Quentin said to me, look, I don't know quite how I'm going to finish this movie. I don't know what the ending is going to be quite yet. But what happens between the two of you will influence that. And at a certain moment, he said, close to the end of the scene, he said, the phone is going to ring. Pick it up. And we were doing the scene. The phone rang. I picked up the phone and improvised a little conversation between me and whoever was at the other end. A mother, I asked her, who is, uh, is there a father in the house? And da-da-da-da. During which time, Pam uh, realizes I am wedded to my business. And she probably recognizes uh, exactly what uh, I have to do, which is stick to my, uh, my business, which is... Uh, helping or uh, being there for or uh, influencing and she realized and she leaves she gets into her car and as you know I uh, follow her out the door and out the road and there she goes yeah and as as that final scene particularly where you you follow out the door and we see your reaction shot we see her reaction shot in the car when you first saw that put together, edited together, what were your thoughts about that? Oh, don't forget, I had uh, never been, I hadn't been in a big start for a long time. So this whole movie, when I saw it, was uh, a little overwhelming. I thought, holy mackerel, this was not just on paper the best job I've ever had, but it's probably one of the best male lead jobs of the year. 
Uh, if, if, it, if it were a different era, it would have probably been uh, Robert Mitchum or Humphrey Bogart. Uh, and I realized uh, what a f mammoth thing it was. And then Harvey Weinstein decided that it was, uh, that he was going to try to get me a nomination. And so they put on a campaign. Which they're very good at doing. Boy, were they good at it. And the next thing I knew, and I didn't have any idea that this was coming, I was on a treadmill of publicity. I had no idea that's how they did it. But uh, one after another, day after day after day after day, and uh, we finished slugging the movie at Christmas, Christmas Day of uh, 1997. And the following day or two, we started the, uh, the campaign. He started the campaign for a nomination, which, uh, which uh, I, you know, is hard to believe, but uh, there you were. And I'm sure you didn't want to get your hopes up. What was it like when you got that nomination? Uh, I, I remember the morning when they were going to be announced. My friend Frank, another actor, said, uh, you're going to get nominated for this. I said, you know, Frank, look, I'm, it's not going to happen. But on the morning, I did know what time it was supposed to be. And my eyes opened up, and I looked at it, and maybe 5.30 or 6.30, whatever the time was that they were supposed to announce it. And it didn't have the phone didn't ring. And so I went back to sleep. Ten minutes later or so, the phone did ring. I said, oh, no, really? I picked it up. It was one of my ex-wives uh, who said, Robert, you got nominated. Then the call waiting came on. And I said, wait a second. See, I hung up. I, and she said, then the, the other ex-wife said, <laughs> you got nominated. Were, you were your ex-wives who were two the first two. Two ex-wives, they were the first two on the phone. I cannot tell you how warm. Oh, my relationships have, have been wonderful. Uh, so, and for 20 or more minutes, I could not hang up the phone. It was call waiting, call waiting. Finally, the... Uh, Finally, the publicist called, uh, got me, and she said, I've been trying to reach you. you there's a car downstairs. Uh, his car is waiting for you. I said, for what? She said, you have to do interviews. Holy moly, I had n practically no wardrobe. I was, you know, I'd been uh, at the bottom of my career for many years by then. I went to the uh, closet. I found a sweater. I still have it. I put on a sweater and a shirt underneath it, and I uh, went down to the car and we did 29 interviews that day. I, uh, I uh, remember coming back after the interviews were over in the car, and I remember it might have been 2 or 3 in the afternoon, and the sun was coming into the sh shining in through the window of the car, and that is when it really hit me. I said, all of those voting members didn't just check off a name. They had to write my name. I am known by a lot of people that I have always uh, uh, respected and admired, and they wrote my name in. It was a feeling of great uh, acceptance and warmth. Bob, you mentioned how far down your career was at that point. Yes. You'd, you'd been the star of, of a network television series where you played the title character, Banyan, in the early 1970s. You'd been a regularly working actor, and, and that started going down. How far down were you when you ran into Quentin Tarantino over breakfast in West Hollywood? Oh, I was catching crumbs that fell through the cracks. I was in the basement by then. <laughs> I, uh, I had four children and uh, two ex-wives and was trying to hold it together. And, uh, and you know, there are moments at which you say to yourself, uh, do I have to find something new to do, or do I, uh, or do I get a chance to continue this? Am I going to have to quit being an actor? And I had an epiphany, Go, walking into a, a, the tennis park over on uh, on uh, Fountain Avenue. I said to myself, I watched Joe Stein over there gently hitting the ball against the wall. Joe Stein was 79 years old. He was a psychiatrist. He still had patience he was still writing books and he could beat me at tennis all I had to do was get the ball to him and he could put it anywhere on the court he wanted to I would chase around I said that's the answer don't quit Bob if you quit uh, it you got to think of something else to get good at and make a living at if you don't quit you still got a shot Joe Stein is never quits 
you can win it in the late innings if you don't quit. And then I said, yeah, but how are you going to get from the hole you're in to winning it in the late innings? And I said, you deliver the, your excellent best right now. That will give you the best shot of the best future you got coming and will give you that reward they always tell you you're going to get, the reward of self-respect and the reward of satisfaction when you deliver your excellent best right now. And then I realized you got to have a good attitude for that. So it became my three-step program. Accept all things. It doesn't matter that you're not getting the good jobs anymore. Relax. Put it behind you. Accept it. It doesn't matter you're not getting the Winnebago anymore, Bob. It doesn't matter she doesn't love you anymore, Bob. Once you accept it, you are in position to deliver your excellent best. And when you deliver that excellent best, you know what they give you. They give you self-respect and satisfaction. And if you don't quit, you can win it in the late innings. Is this part of your interacting program that you took out and would speak to all different groups about? It is exactly that. I, uh, there was a point in my career when it was at the bottom, and I figured if I wasn't getting work as an actor, I better at least find a way to express myself and find a way to, uh, to deliver the best I, I know and understand. Uh, this, by the way, is what I consider art to be. Art has got, we reserve the word art to mean something positive and exceptional. And as far as I am concerned, we use our lives and our life experiences to understand with. And with every action we create, we can deliver that understanding. That is what I figured at some point or another art ought to be. Up, let's let's go back to that that breakfast experience. You're sitting there you, every day in the place near your your house where you're having breakfast, and Quentin Tarantino was there. How did he approach you about this idea of the adaptation he was doing of Elmore Leonard's Rum Punch? Uh, I I was sitting there with Frank, this actor I mentioned before, Frank Pesh, and he uh, and. Quentin walked in. I hadn't seen him there before, but I knew that I had uh, auditioned for him for uh, at Reservoir Dogs. And I yelled over at him. He saw me. He came in. He came out on the patio. He sat with us for a while. During the conversation, I said, what are you up to? He says, I'm, uh, uh, I'm doing an adaptation of Rum Punch. He said, why don't you read it? I did. Six months later, I walked into, it was like a March morning, April, whatever it was. It was cold and wet. And I walked in, walked out onto the patio, and there was Quentin sitting in my spot. And before I even reached the table, he held up a script and he handed it to me. He said, see if you like it. That was it. Wow. Wow. And you were concerned that even though he wanted you, that oh. he might not be able to get you, that they would want someone who at that time was at the top of of the profession. Oh, you bet. Uh, during that period, uh, I never went for a job that somebody bigger didn't manage to to, uh, to take it, accept it. Uh, and so after I'd read it and found out for sure that it was the detective and not some smaller part, because I wasn't really sure that, uh, how, why would he be giving me this good a role? How could he do that? And I said, oh, man. And I saw him, and I talked to him after I read it. And I said, uh, and he came over to uh, the Silver Spoon, and we had breakfast. And I said, look, I think that you're not going to be able to get me for this. I've had this experience before. I, I uh, you know, the, 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 distri the distributors will want somebody bigger. And he said, I hire anybody I want. I didn't realize he had gotten that strong, but he had had Pulp Fiction out, Reservoir Dogs, and he had uh, he had uh, Harvey Weinstein going for him, so he could do whatever he wanted. What a surprise that was! So did that at that moment just hit you like this? Is really going to happen? A ton of bricks. Uh, you know, you stand there, uh, mouth open, thinking, "Could this happen?" I uh, I've been, I had only one long shot strategy and that is that some kid who liked me growing up would turn into a movie maker and give me a good part and that's what happened. Bob, how did Quentin Tarantino direct you as to the character of Max, how he wanted Max Cherry portrayed and what are the things you felt from what you'd read both in Elmore Leonard's book and in the screenplay that gave you guidance on how to portray him? John Huston, the first director I ever had, is famous for having said, and probably other people have said it as well, but is famous for having said, 
casting is 90%. Also, he is famous for having said, and I read it in one of his biographies, when someone asked John Huston, how do the actors know what to do? And Huston said, they read the script. So I can tell you that casting was part of it because probably... Uh, you know, I was uh, good casting. I had already had a, uh, you know, a, a low time in my life and in my career. And uh, Max Cherry was uh, a bit uh, shop-worn and uh, life-weary. And, uh, and so probably those things fit right in. And uh, his script was perfectly uh, measured in terms of what's going to happen and what needs to be said, and uh, phrasing, and his words. Quentin's dialogue is magnificent, in case you have, you've probably read his scripts. They're, <laughs> yeah. they're magnificent. And did, did you feel like, as you're, as you're playing him, that you just, you knew this guy? You'd, you'd met Max's, you knew Max inside now? I bring Max, I bring, look, Actors, I remind actors that one of the things they are required to do is to bring the character to life using themselves, not somebody else and not uh, some other idea of who that person might be, but you got to deliver from who you are, and you've got to mean it. You've got to understand it and mean it so your audience can understand it. And uh, so I'm quite sure that, uh, you know, uh, uh, filtering it through uh, me was uh, easy and... Uh, and, and productive. You have great chemistry with Pam Greer. Had you met her before, or was this first time you'd ever met her, and, and to what do you attribute the great chemistry? Uh, well, first of all, she's a beautiful woman, and I, and I have seen her on screen, and uh, sometimes you can fall in love right from the screen. As many and have with Pam Greer. As many have with Pam Greer, and I among them. Then I did a picture in... Um, in uh, Gary, Indiana, called Original Gangsters. She was in it. We were staying in the same hotel. Frank, this other actor, and I were working on this picture, and he, we were walking around one night, and he said, he said, there's the gym. He looked through the little window that looked into the gym. He says, hey, look who that is. It's Pam Greer. And she was doing her workout. Now, we didn't go in and interrupt her, and... Um, and I, uh, I could have, but, I, but we didn't. I said, oh, let's leave her alone. But uh, we were in the same picture and did not meet. Only as often happens. As often happens. And, uh, but I saw her through that little window and told her afterwards. And, um, and, uh, and so we were in a picture together but never met. And the first time I met her was at the table read uh, for Jackie Brown. And at the table read, because I know you had a long rehearsal period, too. Great rehearsal. It was a, what, the first time we ever, I, I have ever done a rehearsal period for a picture. Two weeks. We went to every important location, and, uh, and we were at the, we did our scenes. We, you know, with the with script in hand. And, uh, and it was so valuable that I have always uh, recommended to new, new directors that they find an opportunity to break the ice with actors so that they can hear each other. Table read is good, uh, but a little rehearsal period seeing some of the major sets is uh, excellent for an actor. At what point did you feel or did you allow yourself to feel that there was a, a, a great chemistry between these two characters that you were both bringing to it. Do you remember the scene in which she leaves the, uh, the jail and she makes a long walk toward camera and part of that, uh, he puts a close-up of me watching her and as she approaches and approaches and approaches, you can see and you can feel what's going on uh, I am uh, n being knocked out of my socks by this woman walking toward me. So by the time she gets to me and I give her my card and tell her I'm her bail bondsman and can I take you home? And uh, yes, she wants to stop for a drink. Uh, I, she needs a cigarette. Uh, by then, it is, uh, it is well established, at least in my feelings. And that's one of the first scenes we did and 
Quentin did something that nobody does. He played the music while we were shooting the scene. It gave rise to personal emotions and, uh, and no doubt helped uh, that scene. Uh, I've never seen it done before or since, but uh, he did it. And so appropriate because the soundtrack is such a huge part of Jackie Brown. It never even occurred to me that you were hearing that as you're acting those hearing, scenes. Hearing uh, a, a selection. I cannot remember whether it was precisely that tune. It might very well have been, but it was so strong that it gave uh, actors, everybody around, to, to evoke emotional that content. mood yep. that the audience would have a, as they, they watched it. Um, you've worked with great directors. You mentioned John Huston. You've worked with David Lynch. and you know, I, I'm not going to do justice to all the great directors that you've, you've worked with. But Alexander with Payne. Alexander Payne, yeah, yes. terrific. Uh, do, does each one leave you with something you use in the future? Or is everything very specialized to the particular project you're working on and not necessarily transferable? You know, it's, I always remind actors, everything counts. Doesn't matter what you've done, it all counts. I've been a dishwasher, I've been a waiter, I worked on the railroad, uh, I've done a lot of different things, it all counts. Every single time you go out there for any director and try to deliver a great shot, because movie making is not a whole movie at a time, it is individual discrete shots, it's the fundamental unit of filmmaking. Each shot you start at zero, and you gotta learn new material, dialogue that you didn't know before, and when you get to the set, you learn the motion of the shot. It's like learning a magic trick. And when you hear action, you've got to deliver this magic trick as beautifully as you can so that when you get to cut, you hear print, move on. Uh, and you have done uh, the magic trick as, uh, as nicely as possible. Each one of those gives you, I'm sure, gives you a little measure of confidence, but you always start at zero with each new shot, each new piece of material. You got to get good at it and facile at it by the time, uh, by the time you hear action. You, uh, I know, been on stage uh, very recently here. Uh, also, I assume you have other film projects coming out. What, what are people going to be seeing you in in the near future? Uh, a wonderful movie called What They Had, uh, Michael Shannon. Um, um, Hillary Swank, um, uh, I'll tell you in a second who I loved, who I, who's played my wife, uh, and that's uh, called uh, What They Had, um, and a play at the, at the uh, Geffen, a new play called uh, uh, Chasing Memories uh, with um, Tyne Daly. Uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's a great time for me. I'm working as some older actors don't, but I cannot tell you how grateful I am. In the middle, I had a long, mm, soft period, but uh, You're as, clearly a, digging as an this, adult, though. however, I'm still <laughs> working. It's great. Well, that, that's like an acting clinic. You and Tyne Daly on stage together, yes. that's, that's some serious acting. Yeah, well, uh, she's wonderful. It's, it's a tour de force for her. And uh, and it'll it's a and it's a musical play. And when they said, "Do you sing?" I did what all actors are supposed to do. Say what, yes. Yes, of Same course. Same when I you can were asked sing. if you rode a horse for your first. Yes, bit. of course I can ride a horse. I'd only been on a horse ten cents a ride around the circle. The when New York I was a boy kid. who can ride a horse could not ride a horse, but uh, I caught on quick. I always say to myself, do it as though you know what you're doing. If you if you're if you're if you're gonna sell yourself as this or that, go at it as strong as you can. Don't go at it um, uh, like uh, timidly. So you've have you been taking voice lessons or no, what have you been doing? No, but they said when I told them I was a limited singer, they said, well you can Sing, speak it. The uh, Rex Harrison Rex approach. Rex Harrison is who they always mention. So I said, great, as long as your expectations are low, I, I will try to, uh, to surpass them. This sounds like a must-see. Bob, before I let you go, anything to add about the Jackie Brown experience that, that people really need to hear about what this was like for you? Oh, for me, it was a life changer. Uh, there are times when in a life you say, I'm going to pull for a good finish, and... Uh, Quentin Tarantino gave me a shot at a good finish, 
and uh, it was a life changer. Bob, thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Thanks very much, Larry.